Good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to Fardell Trinity Church. We're happy you've joined us this beautiful Sunday morning to worship the Lord and fellowship together. And as you make your way to your pews, we ask that you would rise with us as I read this morning's call to worship reading from Psalm 147, verses 7 through 8. It says, Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this passage that reminds us of your sovereignty over creation in all things, that you know everything. You know our needs. You know what, um, what everything is, Lord, and you provide all of these needs by your good and gracious hand. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the joy to be able to gather this morning as your people to worship, to serve you, to give our attention and our focus fully on you. We just pray, Lord, that everything we do and everything we say would bring honor and glory to your name. So we commit each one and we commit this service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we praise the Father on this wonderful Father's Day.
Oh, 
Lord, we pray to you, our Heavenly Father, especially on this Father's Day, to remember you as the Father, the King and Lord of all. And we remember that you, the Father, sent your Son, Jesus. And we know that Jesus and the Father are one. We thank you that you came down to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we love that you are a self-sacrificial love, God, that you die for us, that you want us, Lord, that you love us. Lord, I pray that the fathers, especially of our church, not just this church, but the universal, the, the whole church, that we would be strong fathers like you, being strong in our faith, laying down our life for the sheep. Lord, we just thank you for the fathers here, right here at FBC, that they are leading the church. We thank you so much for your word and for you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Father's Day. We're about to ha uh, have our greeting time, and during that time, we encourage you to drop your offering in the back of the sanctuary. Why don't we all greet one another in fellowship?
Well, why don't we all return to our pews and let's rise and sing the family of God because that's who we are. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. Though I'm part of the family, the family of God. Good morning, Fardell family. It's good to see you this morning. It's a beautiful uh, June day out there on this Father's Day, and uh, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. I love that song that we sang about Jesus, our living hope. That's why we're here today, right? Our hope is in Christ, and we celebrate him, our Savior, today. So uh, we have an opportunity for a couple of special presentations this morning. And I'm really excited about this first one because I don't think she knows it's coming. But I would like to invite Nicole Class to come and join me up here on the platform. Nicole, if you would come, please. You can go ahead and clap, Jeff. That's fine. You don't know what you're clapping for yet, but that's okay. We'll, we'll tell you. You didn't know, did you, Nicole? That's okay. That, that's all right. It, this, you'll enjoy this, I promise. Oh, okay. So if you didn't know this, Nicole serves as our financial accountant for our church, which is a very important job. She uh, makes the deposits, and she pays the checks and the bills and makes sure that everything is in good order. And she has been doing this faithfully and consistently for 20 years, 20 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there you go. Yeah, I, you know, the Bible says we should give honor to whom honor is due. And uh, I love celebrating faithful service for the Lord. And Nicole, we, we do appreciate you and we love you. Um, we are so grateful for your ministry that you have given consistently and professionally and with excellence for 20 years. And so we want you to know we value you and we're grateful for this important ministry for our church. So we have some flowers for you. I'm, I'm gonna have Ed come and join me here and we also have a gift card from our church that we'd like to give to you. And uh, uh, no, no, that's for you, that's for you. I'm gonna have Ed lead us in, in prayer of thanksgiving for Nicole and her ministry, but before we do that, let's congratulate her one more time. Would you do that? You. You're welcome. We're, Ed, go ahead and pray. What, what Lee failed to, to mention is Nicole was five when she started that job, so. Uh, so, but let's go to the Lord in prayer for this uh, celebration. Our God and Father, we just come to you today with grateful hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you brought Nicole and Brian and their family here so many years ago. And Nicole has used her gifts and talents, Lord, to serve you and serve your church. We thank you, God, for blessing her with the talents needed to help steer our church so many years. And we just lift her in prayer to you. We're thankful, Lord, for her commitment, her dedication her love for you and her love for this church. We just ask that you continue to bless her, continue to watch over her, continue to help as she guides our church into the next decade and beyond that. And so we just lift this time of celebration to you. We thank you, Lord, and praise you in your name. I'm not the as beautiful member of the class family, but I do tell better jokes, so let's just keep it at that. Good morning, everybody. Again, welcome to Fardell Trinity Church. We're glad that you're here. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Thank you for all that you do for us. 
even in our church family, the, the, the men are so important uh, as they lead us uh, closer to Christ. So we appreciate that uh, very much. A couple of quick announcements. Again, a reminder, if you miss anything, you want more information, our website is there. Also, Facebook and Instagram are up. If you need anything, if you have any questions that aren't answered there or you'd like to learn more, uh, please give the church office a call. The number's in the bulletin. Pastor Lee and Pastor Mike both have their emails in the bulletin. Or feel free to stop by during the week. Even throughout the summer, they're here throughout the week uh, preparing and serving and doing all the things that they do. So uh, happy to have you stop by. And if there's anywhere we can help you, uh, we certainly can. And we appreciate that. And uh, we encourage you to, to plug in to the many ministries that we have, not just here on Sunday morning, but throughout the week and throughout the summer. We have lots of cool stuff coming on. Uh, today is just a final reminder to bring your baby bottles back uh, for supporting Life Advocate Ministries, a local ministry that we support through this event every year. Uh, they help uh, young pregnant at-risk families. Uh, so that's a great opportunity for us to share uh, some of our resources with them. So hopefully you, you got a bottle and you bring it back. There's a, 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 a container to put them back. You filled it with change. If, if you didn't bring it this week, drop it off to the, the church this week or by next week. They even take empty ones back. Uh, if you took one and didn't have a chance to fill it, well, here's your last chance. Uh, but they definitely use them again and again. They recycle them every year. So uh, thanks to all who participate in this and continue to keep Life Advocate Ministries in our prayers throughout the year as they minister in our community. They're very local. Uh, they're right in Hawthorne and, and the surrounding area here. So great local ministry that we support. Also, it's getting close, right? The church-wide missions trip is uh, only two weeks away, two weeks from yesterday. It, it's, uh, it's made it on the calendar in our home kitchen. Uh, I can see it peeking around the corner. Uh, a, a big Atlanta with a lot of explanation points around it. We're excited to go. Uh, so we're going to be serving with our, one of our ministry partners with OM. You know who they are. They, uh, they've been up here before. We've heard from them. We get videos from them. Uh, so we're going to be st working with them uh, for a week in Georgia. So really prayer is what we're asking for at this point. Our, our team is set. They've had their last meeting. They brought home the packet of information from Mike. Right, which I think was hard bound this year. It was, it was so robust. Uh, so pray for these folks. There's going to be 15 students and adults. Uh, my entire family is going, so lots of prayers from my side. I'm very excited uh, that my girls are going, uh, including Nicole, and, and uh, others are going, and, and I know it's going to be a great time. I know our missionary down there very well. He's a very good friend of mine. It'll be an awesome trip. I've spoken to him about it. Mike's been in contact with him for months now, a year about this. So, so pray for this as, as they outreach to the Muslim community. Uh, pray for travel safety. Uh, pray for good, impactful work while they're there. The, the going forth of the gospel through being the hands and feet of Jesus in these communities and a transformational time for our, our kids and our adults that are going. So two weeks left to pray before they go. A whole week that they're going to be gone. Heavy prayer will be needed uh, and then they'll be back to report back to us uh, in early July. So we're looking forward to this and uh, just keep it in your prayers, mark it on your calendars to, to pray consistently for this trip coming up. And another opportunity for prayer and service, uh, which is a, a great intersection for us, is VBS. The sign's on the front lawn. Allegedly, it was here last week. We talked about it this morning, and both kids said it was there last week, too. We didn't see it. Now we saw it this week. There it is. So VBS is that, that first week of July, so, or uh, August, rather. It's July 31st through August 4th. Lots of opportunities to serve. So we've talked about all these already. Uh, the sign-up sheets are on the circular tables in the middle of the foyer on the way back. Please sign up to help. You can help beforehand. I know some of the work's already started because I see furniture moving throughout the church magically from one room to the other as we empty rooms out to build them up. You can serve throughout the week in various things all morning from 8 or 8.30 when we start till about noontime when we let the kids go. There's Friday night at the picnic and then clean up on Saturday uh, to get us back to our normally scheduled church layout. Uh, but you'll see stuff being built in all these rooms, including the sanctuary over the next couple weeks. So great opportunity to pray, great opportunity to serve, be the hands and feet right here locally with our church uh, and, our, and our community here in Mawa and the surrounding areas. And if your kid's coming, please make sure you register them at our website. Uh, they're not an automatic in, but uh, we'll probably have room for them, I'm sure. But that if you register early, Name tags are ready, everything is just a very seamless operation for us. So uh, pray for this, and please sign up on your way out today. It's only like five weeks away. It's right around the corner. June's almost over, and this starts the last week in July. At this time, I'm going to have Mike come up, and we're going to celebrate some graduates today. Thank you, Brian. 
At around this point every year, we like to honor our high school graduates. And uh, this year, graduating out of our youth program and graduating out of high school, we have two high school seniors who will be going off to college, and that is David Leonsi and Hunter Yeager. So I'm gonna call both of those guys up to the front, and uh, what they're gonna do for you is they're gonna share with you uh, where they're going to college and what they're gonna be studying so that we as a congregation could pray for them now and then we as a congregation could pray for them as we go. So maybe David or Hunter, you could get us started. Just let us know where you're gonna go to college and what you're gonna be studying. I'm going to Montclair State University and I'm gonna be studying nursing. And I'm going to uh, Purdue University and I'm studying aerospace engineering. So I don't know if, if all of you know, but both David and Hunter, they've been coming to our youth program since they were in sixth grade. So that, that's about seven years they've been coming to our youth program. But even before that, they were involved in VBS and Kids Night and these boys have, these young men, they've been a blessing to our church family, and they've been a blessing to our youth ministry as well. So we need to pray for them as they go. Um, we trust and we know that God has a plan for both of their lives. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. So we know that the Lord does have a specific purpose and he has a specific plan for both of your lives. And as we trust that, we also desire that you would uphold your responsibility as young Christian men to walk faithfully with the Lord and to continue to obey him in everything you do. So this is what we need to pray for. So why don't we go before the Lord together as a congregation and we'll pray for these young men. Lord, we thank you <clears throat> for this time, this special time to honor and recognize David and Hunter. We thank you for each of them and each of their lives. We thank you for the blessing that they are to our congregation and to our youth ministry. We just pray for your hand upon them as they go off to college. We pray for your hand upon them in every way. Academically, we pray that you would bring success, that they would put their heart and mind to everything that they do and work diligently as serving you, not men. In their hard work, I pray that they would bring you honor and glory. More than academic success, Lord, we pray for spiritual success. We pray that you would continue to make each of these young men who you want them to be, young men who are on fire for you, who love you, who serve you, who grow in you and become more like you in everything they do. We pray that you would guard them and protect them from the evil one who just wants to take them and snatch them away. We pray that you would guard their faith, pray that they would be bold and, and confident and strong in what they believe and know to be good and right and true, and that they would boldly take a stand for what they believe and for their, for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in places that are dark and crooked. So Father, we lift them to you. We know that you have a special purpose and plan for them, and we pray that you would just bring that to fruition. Pray that they would walk in step with your spirit each day, and uh, Lord, that they would seek you and seek to please you in all that they do. We love you, and we commit them to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hunter?
this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of men who've sinned against us. it is in heaven. Lord, we thank you for prayers like the Lord's Prayer that teach us how to pray to you. Lord, we thank you that we have the word that teaches us how to live, how to be more like you. Lord, we pray that when Pastor Lee preaches the word today, that we would learn from you. Especially the fathers today, we want to learn to be more like you, the almighty heavenly father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Donnie and Deb. Appreciate your special music this morning. Children, we're going to dismiss you uh, right now for All Kids Church, uh, age four through grades four. You can go downstairs at this time and enjoy a good time of uh, worship and learning downstairs. And I would invite you to join me this morning in Ephesians chapter 5 as we continue our study in this book to the praise of, the, of His glory in the church. Uh, before I begin in Ephesians chapter 5, I also want to pass on my thankfulness for you dads and wish you a happy Father's Day. Uh, guys, you are so important to your families to your wife, to your kids, your grandkids, and to our church. And I thank God for you. Um, You are the godly examples that are standing in the gap. Don't become weary in well-doing. Our role can sometimes be difficult and challenging, but it's very important as we continue to mentor our own children and uh, grandchildren to follow Christ, even as this passage will teach us this morning. So thank you guys. Keep on keeping on. God bless you in your special role. And and I would say this for some of you that maybe uh, didn't have a good relationship with a dad or maybe your dad really wasn't involved in your life or didn't know the Lord. I want to remind you that all of us have a heavenly father and he is absolutely perfect and unconditional in his love for us. And he can meet the need where we didn't maybe have the human relationship that we wished we had, but our Heavenly Father gave his all for us, even his only begotten Son, to prove to us 
how much he loves us. So dads, let's be that kind of dad as we mimic Christ, and we'll learn how to do that even in this passage this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, if you remember last week, and this week we're going to be talking about walking in love, light, and wisdom, three aspects of our walk. But last week we talked about this new walk, this new manner of living, a new set of spiritual clothes, if you will, that we must put on that is expected of us when we become new creatures in Christ. We sing a new song, we have a new goal, we have a new lifestyle. And so today, the continuation of Paul's letter builds on what we learned last week about all of those new criteria or new characteristics in living the Christian walk for the glory of God. And uh, I, I think once again that these four areas of walking will help us practically to become more formative in our um, reflection of who Jesus Christ is, to follow him, to obey him, to be more like him. So um, here's kind of the um, big idea that we're going to be looking at today from this passage. And I, when I give you a big idea, it's meant to capture our attention and focus the direction on how we're going to study. What do we expect this passage to help us to do? Well, it will identify for us that in a healthy body of believers like is gathered here at Fardale, that we are the living proof of the reality of Christ in their lives. Well, what if someone said to you, so you're a Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. And what if they said to you, well, prove it. Prove that you're a Christian. What's different? Oh, what makes you um, and you, you've probably heard the statement, I think Christians uh, walk around with this uh, more uh, holy-than-thou attitude. Can you explain to them through talk and walk what the difference is in your life, that you are living proof of the reality that Jesus Christ lives in you? And that's what this passage is all about, uh, proving or demonstrating um, the new life of Christ in us. So, four aspects of this is what we're going to study, four proofs of our new walk in Christ. Here's the first one that we're going to look at, the proof of walking in love. The proof of walking in love. Uh, look at what Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 say as we begin this passage. Therefore, now, I'm going to come back to that because I know you as good Bible students know that every time the word therefore is there, you look what it's there for. In other words, it refers back to something that we studied last week, and we'll mention that. Therefore, be imitators of God. Imitators. Now, that's an interesting word. We have imitation things. Um, imitation milk or imitation pudding, and it's supposed to replicate the real thing as best as it possibly can. Be imitators of God as beloved children of God, okay? And um, I, you probably heard the phrase, well, he's just a, a chip off the old block, which kind of means, yeah, that, that, that son really, we could see a lot of his dad in him, or that daughter, we can see a lot of the mom and them, imitators as beloved children. If we have that relationship with God as his children, we ought to be imitating some of the characteristics that we have learned from him, primarily when Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. He wants us to display the holiness of God in the way we walk, in the way we live. And then he says, and walk in love. Even as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us to be a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what does it mean to walk in love? What is the proof of our new life, walking in love, that demonstrates that Christ is alive in us? Well, let's unpack this a little bit. I want you to notice this progression that we've studied in the last few 
weeks. And um, if you have your scriptures uh, handy there, uh, this progression, notice in chapter 3, verse 17, we are told, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may be rooted and grounded in love. That was Paul's prayer for the Ephesian Christians and for us, that we would be rooted and grounded in the love of God. What keeps us part of the family? What keeps us motivated to live the way we ought to live? It's the love of God. We're rooted and grounded in that love relationship that God has given to us. But notice this next step. Chapter 4, verse 15, jump over there. It says we are to speak the truth in love. And remember, that is couched in the middle of that passage of spiritual gifts. How do you use your spiritual gifts? Well, we're going to be affecting each other, right? We're building each other up with our spiritual gifts. And the principle that is the overlying principle of using all those spiritual gifts is this one, speak the truth in love. I owe it to you to speak the truth, to not sugarcoat the truth, uh, not to be demeaning in speaking the truth, but speak truth and do it in love. If I'm speaking truth and love to someone, then that means I want what's ver the very best for them. I want to build them up. I want to demonstrate that I love them and encourage them. And then in verse 16, the very next verse, Paul says we are to be built up in love so that if we are exercising our spiritual gifts in the right way, if we are rooted and grounded in love, speaking the truth in love, then that same love will build us up in the body of Christ. We will be an encouragement to each other. Is it okay to say in the body, man, I, I love you. I love you guys. We, as Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be able to say to each other, I, I love you, and, and I want what's very, very best for you. Now, knowing that progression, walking in love means we are to imitate God by reflecting His love. 1 Corinthians 13 is often called the love chapter. And all the characteristics about God's love, it's patient, it's kind, it's long-suffering. Do people see that kind of love relationship that we have with Christ that is then fleshed out and demonstrated to others? Do you know this last phrase, right? They will know we are Christians by our love one for another, right? Isn't that what Jesus told his disciples? So I think walking in love is a demonstration of imitating God. How do we imitate God? Well, God's love was self-sacrificial. It was um, um, totally inexhaustible. In other words, he gave the very best that he had. He, he gave his son. And so that if we're going to walk in the love of Christ, it ought to be a demonstrable part of our lives that people could see. How, how do those people get along so well? How is it that they love each other? Do people outside of Christ look at us in our relationships with each other and say, man, they, they, they have something I don't have. They've got a love. They've got that glue they're walking in love, and they're imitating the love of God as a reflection towards each other. Listen, find somebody today and tell them how much you love them. Maybe it's your own dad that you just need to say, Dad, I love you. He'll probably respond by, great, treat me to a steak dinner today. I don't know. But let's not be afraid to tell each other that we love each other and show each other in tangible ways. Walking in love is part of the proof that we have been changed. We live in a very caustic, negative world, don't we? People would rather fight or curse or whatever, uh, they, you know, even a road rage or wh whatever type of manifestation that is the opposite of love, that's the prince of the power of the air and the ones that don't know God. That's how they act. We owe it to God and to each other 
to demonstrate that the love of God works in changing people's lives. Paul said it this way to the Corinthian church. He says, the love of Christ constrains you. It wraps its ownership around you and constrains you to be an ambassador of the love of Christ to other. The proof of walking in love, even as we witness, even as we live in this sin-cursed world, it's not going to do us any good to get mad at people and to get angry with people, but if we can speak the truth in love and show them that the truth will set them free, that is the type of walk in love that Paul is asking us to grab a hold of, to understand, and to apply in our lives. Are we walking in love? Secondly, here's the second proof. The proof of personal holiness. This is the one that pretty much takes up a good hunk of this passage. If we are changed, if we are new in Christ, then... um, there's going to be a personal holiness that will take hold as part of our everyday walk. Now, uh, as Paul often does, uh, he, he teaches this principle through comparison. And you're going to see the comparison in the following passage. Here's what he says. He doesn't mince any words. He gets right to the point. He says, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness Listen to these strong words. Must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Man, Paul is drawing a line in the sand right there when it comes to sexual immorality and impurity. And he says it shouldn't even be named among you. That's what's proper. That's what's expected as saints, as believers. Now, all of this passage, before we go any further, I I want you to remember what we learned Uh, last week um, when we talked about the put-offs and the put-ons. He says in the middle of the passage, he says, remember when he talked about the Gentiles being darkened in their sin and in their lifestyle, in chapter 4, verse 20, he says, but that's not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus Christ. So as we go through this passage now, remember what Paul's already said. There's the therefore. Uh, He can say this, therefore, because we've already been taught by Paul. That's not the way you learned Christ. Christ has made a difference in your life. So here's one area. Sexual immorality and covetousness should be put away. Then verse 4, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking. We'll come back and talk about that because they're out of place. Instead of filthiness, crude joking, there ought to be thanksgiving. Wow, that's a difference. Verse 5, he returns to this. He says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater. In other words, they've made something else or someone else their god. Well, they will have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You can't have it both ways. You can't worship and and give your allegiance to something else or someone else as a, a God replacement and still have a part in the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the things he just stated, The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Listen, judgment will be coming. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Verse 7, therefore, there's another therefore, because of what he just said, do not become partners with them. Don't walk with them. Don't participate in their evil deeds. But now, At one time, though you were part of that darkness, you are now light in the Lord. Notice that difference in those two metaphors. The darkness of sin compared to the light of Christ. It's like he has opened our eyes. He's illuminated us. He's turned the light bulb on so that we understand the difference. 
walk as children of light. So we're learning today, walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom. And then he says, take no part in the unfruitful words of darkness, but instead expose them. Call them what they are. Don't call evil good and good evil, which our culture does. Verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. You feel that way? That even the, the indulgence of sin, that group of perpetual indulgent fake Catholic nuns that invaded Dodger Stadium last week, did you read about that? Oh my goodness, they are shameful in the activities that they're indulging in. And we shouldn't even hardly even be able to talk about that without having a disdain or labeling it for what it is. It is contrary to God's holiness. So here's the context of this passage, why Paul is getting so um, strong-worded in his warnings to believers. Remember, the people to whom this letter was originally written, the Ephesian church, the believers there, lived in a pagan city filled with spiritual darkness, surrounded by immorality, ungodliness, and decadence. There was a temple to Diana. There was prostitution. There was worship and sexual immorality that was woven together. Can you imagine that? Oh, yeah, Pastor, we live in that kind of society today, too, don't we? I mean, the, the mixing even of religion and immorality. And so Paul's warning to the Ephesian church was say, don't have anything to do with that. That's not part of your new life. That's part of your old life. Here's our response. Since we are very much like the culture of Ephesus, we need to understand that conformity to Christ is in total contrast to conformity to the world. We have been called to imitate Christ in our personal holiness. Friends, let's get this one straight. We can't have a foot in both sides of this world. <laughs> For a Christian, you can't keep a foot in the world's activities and philosophies and indulgence of promiscuity and sexual immorality and covetousness, heaping upon yourself all of the indulgences that the world says, hey, do anything you want to do. You name it. Go for it. It's your life. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't do. You can't have one foot there and the other foot in the church or in the Christian walk because the two are not compatible with each other. They don't mix. It's like oil and water. You, you just can't have a mixing or compatibility between the two. So let's look at how this works out now as far as um, uh, the difference between a cultural conformity and a conformity to Christ. So here's what the passage says. If you're going to conform to the culture of today, then sexual immorality is going to be part of that. That's what this world does in all forms. And you and I know that those forms have taken a wild turn to the left in the last 10 years, haven't they? Things that would not even have been talked about. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I would love to go back about 20 years ago. Even in a college class, let, let's say it's a psychology class. And read the textbook for general psychology there compared to what they would teach in general psychology today. Do you know that the abnormal sexual behavior of lesbianism, homosexuality, transsexuality, do you know that all of that, as, as, as early as 20 years ago, was taught in another course, not general psych, it was taught in a course called abnormal psychology. In other words, even the world recognized that that was deviant behavior. That was something that was not consistent with a person's 
uh, gender. Now we're told, well, there's, oh, there's got to be five, six, seven, eight different kind of genders that you can choose. And by the way, God had nothing to do with it. Did you know that? God had nothing to do with you being assigned male or female. That's what our culture is telling us today. Sexual immorality. But if we're going to conform to Christ, here's Paul's command. That shouldn't even be named among you. Now, I will speak some harsh words here, but they are the truth in love. There is no such thing as a continual homosexual lifestyle and Christianity. You cannot be a Christian homosexual. They are opposed to each other. Now, by the way, you cannot be a Christian adulterer either. You could be involved in heterosexual sin and continue in it, and that's not consistent with conformity to Christ either. So I'm not just singling out one type of sin. I'm saying whatever form, I agree with Paul on this, whatever form of sexual immorality is being practiced in the world today, it is not acceptable to God, therefore it is not acceptable to those of us who have had our lives changed by the grace of God. We've been called to a higher standard. You know why this is true? All you have to do is go back to Genesis chapter 3 and see how God created man, male and female. He created them in the image of God and told them as part of the command, be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy the sexual relationship in marriage that I've told you I would bless. And as a result of that is going to be offspring. But every other type of deviant activity is sexual immorality. All right, so let's get off that one and go to something else that maybe is more of a subtle thing for Christians to deal with. Do you know that cultural conformity involves itself in filthy, foolish talk? Can I be very straight out there with you? I am so tired and so turned off by the constant use of guttural language in the world, and sometimes it seeps into the church as well. Now you read papers and news articles, and you don't even have to guess what was said anymore because they'll give you the first letter of the curse word, right? F blank, 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 S blank, 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 G blank, blank, D blank, blank, and all of that Filthy, foolish talk is out there constantly. Well, I guess we ought to expect that of a world that doesn't know God because, again, their conscience isn't bothered by the use of filthy, foolish talk. But what about us as Christians? If immorality is not named among you, should filthy and foolish talk, even jokes with sexual innuendo in them. Should they be part of a Christian's vernacular, their vocabulary? I think not. I think we need to be careful in the verbiage we use that we not succumb to the world's way of communicating, which is filthy and vulgar. You know what? Paul gives us a different opportunity. He says, how about speaking with thanksgiving? The world is so disgusted and so unhappy with their lives that everything is blankety-blank this and blankety-blank this. How about Christians saying, but you know what? I've got a great God. I'm thankful for the blessings in my life. I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my parents. I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for my fr- Thanksgiving. You can tell the difference between a person that is miserable in their life and someone that is really enjoying life by the very principle of whether they are thankful or not. How about it? Are we thankful people? Do we exhibit the proof of personal holiness through putting off filthy language and instead talking in thanksgiving speech? Verse 5, he says, he just, just a reminder, practicing immorality cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, it's not talking about a person who's committed one sexual sin. They've repented from that. Hey, they've been forgiven. Grace is still 
um, applicable for individual sins. What he's talking about is those that have adopted a lifestyle where they're not ashamed of it, they won't repent of it, and they will continue in it. That type of immorality cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And in verse 6, in conformity to Christ, we read these things. Don't be sucked in by that. Don't be deceived by vain words. Don't let people tell you, oh, it's okay. If you want to do that, go ahead. Paul is very careful to say judgment will come. Judgment is coming on that type of activity that has no place in the church and no place in the kingdom of God. And then here's that comparison. Verse 8, cultural conformity. You were once in darkness. We were there too, weren't we? Before we came to Christ, that's the lifestyle that we could have ended up in, but now we've come to the light. It reminds me of that great incarnation passage that we quote at Christmas in, in John chapter 1. In him was light, Christ, and the light was the life of men. Uh, we have been enlightened the light of the Holy Spirit has illuminated truth in our lives so that we are able to overcome the darkness. A couple more comparisons in that passage. The works of darkness, and here's an important one for us as Christians, expose the darkness. Don't call evil good. Look at all of that activity we talked about before. Let's not get confused. We ought to speak out against it. We ought to say, I I'm not for that. That is an aberration, and it is a stench in the nostrils of a holy God to participate in that type of activity. Expose the darkness. Speak the truth. Don't water down. Don't accommodate just because the world wants to live in a libertarian way to choose any type of sinful expression. And then lastly, cultural conformity involves secret acts, hiding the truth. Have, have you noticed those that participate in these things? They don't really want to hear truth. They, they don't want their sinfulness exposed. Yet we, rather than being embarrassed to even speak of the evil acts, are to instead expose them to the light and say, this is the standard of holiness that God calls us to. That is sin. We will not return to it. That's exactly what God saved us from. You, you know, it's interesting, um, this comparison of, of us having to live, sometimes we feel like we're probably just a single light living in a cultural plethora of darkness, right? <laughs> I, I read this story about a man who was escorted into a coal mine. He'd never been down in one before. He was a little curious. At the entrance of one of the dim passageways to the coal mine, he spied a beautiful white flower growing out of the black earth. He asked his friend, how, how can it blossom in such purity and radiance in this dirty coal mine? And his guide replied, well, here, throw some coal dust on it and see for yourself. So when he did, he was surprised that the fine, sooty particles slid right off the snowy petals, leaving the plant just as lovely and unstained as before. Its surface was so smooth that the grit and grime could not adhere to it. Friends, in the same way, we need to have a little bit of a Teflon characteristic to us. You know what I mean by that? Teflon is supposedly that cookware that it, you know, it, stuff slips right off of it. So you throw the grime of the world on a Christian, it ought to not stick. It ought to slip off. Our hearts should have that same characteristic. Just as that flower cannot control its habitat, we can't help it that we live in a world filled with such filth and evil, but God's grace can keep us clean and unspotted, though we touch are touched by every side of the evil and it wants to cling to us. We need to respond in this call to personal holiness. Do not let the world and its evil deeds 
overtake your commitment to personal holiness. All right, we'll finish these last two, hopefully a little bit quicker. The proof of spiritual fruit. So we've talked about the proof of walking in love and the proof of personal holiness. What about the fruit of the Spirit? What does this have to do as far as proving that we have new life? Well, here's what Paul says in verses 8 through 10. You are light in the Lord. That's the principle. You've been changed. You now have the light of the Holy Spirit within you. Walk as children of light. Now notice what he says about the fruit of light that is found uh, in all that is good and right and true, and then try to discern what is pleasing of the Lord or pleasing to the Lord. I, I, I'm centering in on that phrase, the fruit of light. In other words, if we are walking in the light, we're walking in love, now we're walking in light, what, what does that produce? What's the fruit of our lives that come out of walking in truth, walking in light, walking in love? Well, here's a couple of thoughts. Uh, the, the spiritual fruit means that we are proving in our daily walk the thoughts, attitudes, and behaviors that are, as the verse says, acceptable to the Lord, Good, right, and true. How's your thought patterns today? What is it that you dwell on? What, what do you really think on? What fills your minds? Even in the quiet times when you're all alone, what do you meditate on? The evil one always wants to interrupt your thought patterns, does he not? And invade your personal space and get you to think evil thoughts. Yet here we're told the fruit of the Spirit can produce that which is acceptable, good, right, and true, and that the Holy Spirit empowers you, in other words, helps you to discern those right actions through spiritual fruitfulness. In other words, here's what I'm saying. Spiritual fruit is totally connected to our response of personal holiness because it helps us discern the difference between what is right and wrong, and choosing the right as opposed to choosing the wrong. Spiritual fruit. Like what? Well, you know this passage in Galatians chapter 5, right? Here's what it says. Here's the simple formula. Uh, walking in the light, we've been illuminated by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We've studied that before, right? So, Paul says, hey, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It all comes back to a matter of control. Remember we talked about the filling of the Holy Spirit? It's not that we get more of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is getting more of us. We're letting have Him have more control of every aspect of our life. Our goals, our desires, our education, our marriage, our life partner, our kids, our, our cars, our bank accounts. Everything is under His control. And Paul says, if you walk by the control of the Holy Spirit in your life, you won't gratify, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Again, because you can't walk with the Spirit and still desire the sinful fleshly appetites. And here's what he uh, means by that, describing the difference. He says, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to each other. They're the oil and water to each other, and they keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Then he gets specific and tells you about the desires of the flesh. Verse 19, the works of the flesh are evident, and it almost sounds like Paul lifted this passage from what he just said in Ephesians chapter 5, doesn't it? Here's how you know if you're living under the control of the flesh. You're practicing sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enemy, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. That's all fleshly action and attitudes. He's mimicking what he just said in Ephesians chapter 5 about the conformity to culture and sinfulness. But, remember... He's contrasting walking by the Spirit or walking by the flesh. Well, the orange is walking by the flesh. Let's see what walking by the Spirit involves. Oh, I forgot a few. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. 
And as I warned you, I warned you before that those who do those things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot have it both ways. But, and here's what we need to hear, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And here's his culminating statement on this contrast. Verse 24, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. How do you know that you're a Christian? Somebody says, prove to me that you're a Christian. Well, my life is different. I used to struggle with alcohol or drug abuse. I used to struggle with sensuality, sexual fornication. I used to struggle with idolatry. I used to struggle with, with self-worship. But that's part of my past. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are coming, become new. I, uh, those who belong to Christ have crucified, have put to death those fleshly appetites and attitudes. Paul said it earlier in Galatians this way. You know this verse, Galatians 2.20, right? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. That's the secret. That's the fruit of the Spirit living within us. So ask yourself the question, what fruit is growing out of your life? All right, well... We've got to get to the last one because I'm already over time. Proof of understanding God's timetable and his will for you. I'll just summarize these statements. Uh, <clears throat> he says, anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, here's the command, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, so there's the third aspect of our walk. We're walking in love, walking in light, and walking in wisdom. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So here's some summary statements about this. Verse 14 challenges us to awaken from spiritual complacency. Hey, if you're in a place right now where you're just going through the motions as a Christian and you are living half in the world and half in the church or half for Christ and half for yourself, he basically says, wake up. Allow the love and light of Christ to shine in and through you. This is his purpose for you, to reflect the glory of God. Verse 15, he says, be careful of the way you walk or the way you conduct yourself. Be discerning, be wise, especially in the culture in which we live. Don't let it bring you down. Don't let it suck you in. And then in verse 16, he says, there's a sense of urgency to use our time and impact well because of these evil days. Friends, we believe in the imminent return of Christ, do we not? That means he could return at any moment. And I can guarantee you that his return is closer today than it was yesterday, and it will be closer tomorrow than it is today. The time is coming when Jesus will come again. In light of that, we are told to use our time and impact well because the culture is not going to get any better until Jesus comes. Using our time, someone said it this way, just a tiny little minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Every minute counts for the glory of God. Dawson Trotman, founder and first president of the Navigators, once said, the greatest time wasted is the time getting started. 
So do it today. Today's the day. Do you know Christ? If you don't know Christ, the Bible says today is the acceptable day of salvation. Don't delay. Dwight David Eisenhower, former president of the United States, is quoted as saying, the urgent is seldom important. The important is seldom urgent. Too often life is controlled by the tyranny of the urgent. We put aside higher and more worthy goals just to put out the fires of our life. And then one author said this about middle-class Americans. He said most of them tend to worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. As a result, their meanings and values are distorted, their relationships disintegrate faster than they can keep them in repair, and their lifestyles resemble a cast of characters in search of a plot. Oh, friends, don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. The time is now. There's a sense of urgency. And understand what God's will is for your life. Understand what God's will is for your life. Simply put, it's this. Don't be conformed to the world. Cultural conformity is not consistent with Christ conformity. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that every one of us will keep testing. That means we keep discerning what is the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, Pastor Mike stood up here with these two graduates and said, guys, do you know that God has a claim on your life? He has a plan for your life. God wants to reveal his will to those two young men, that they have a path to follow, not just for them, but for all of us as well. Discern regularly, constantly, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How do you know the will of God? Well, here's one way. It's not the will of God if it goes against the word of God. Simply put, you cannot be doing the will of God if it is contrary to biblical thought and precept to be walking in love and light and wisdom. So, that's my challenge for today. How are you walking? I hope you're walking in the love of Christ, in the light of Christ, and in the wisdom of God's word, which will continue to reveal his perfect will for us. It's a process. God is making us more into the image of his son. Our, our friend Alistair Begg says it this way, God is making you holy. It's a painful process. It's a radical process. It concerns not only your conduct, but also your conversation. Not only your deeds, but also your desires. Let's learn to walk in love, in light, and in wisdom, because the days are dark and evil. We need to walk with Christ. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, help us to be people who are convinced that the path of love, light, and wisdom is the true path you've designed for us. Help us to pursue it, apply it, and to be controlled by the Holy Spirit in making these patterns evident in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's rise and praise the Lord with our voices again.
him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. You all have a blessed week, and remember to shine your light in the name of Christ. Amen.